Thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I think much has been said, um, and I will go straight into the talk, given that uh, we are on the hour. Um, so tonight, I will uh, um, tell you about the Herola story. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Herola, it's this beautiful animal that you're seeing on your screen um, is restricted to northeastern Kenya, just south of one particular county in a very small geographical location. Uh, it's called, uh, many of you, many people call it the Herola antelope, others call it four-eyed antelope. Uh, uh, and it's also referred to often as the world's most endangered antelope. Um, so the story, between myself and the Herola is that we were born in the same geographical location. I was born to a nomadic parent, um, Somali origin in Northeastern Kenya. Um, and both of my parents are livestock herders and they primarily used same areas, same geographical areas uh, with the Herola antelope. This is actually the house of my father, um, and this is where I grew up. And uh, the, it's a very remote setting. Northeastern Kenya is very marginal part of Kenya, very dry area as well. Uh, and it's, uh, despite that, it also has huge biodiversity, uh, many wildlife that are unique to this area. In fact, the whole of this area is an extension of the Horn of Africa biodiversity hotspot. Uh, we have several biodiversity hotspots in Africa, and the Horn of Africa is one of them. And this is the southern extension of that uh, of of the Horn of Africa biodiversity hotspot. Uh, so the culture here is nomadic pastoralism. And people move from one point to another. Uh, camel is primarily used as the main means of transport. Um, of course, it's very undeveloped uh, region compared to other parts of Kenya. And of course, there has been historical uh, conflict issues. This area is also an area that has been heavily impacted by climate um, and other natural disasters like drought, like floods. Uh, and so um, poverty and illiteracy is extremely high in this region compared to the rest of Kenya. And of course, um, this extends all the way to the larger or the greater Somalia, uh, which the state collapsed nearly three decades ago. Uh, so this species, as you see, calls this place home. So we share home. Uh, so I, uh, in say nearly three decades ago, while I was looking after my father's cow, uh, cows, I was forcefully captured by the military, taken to school, uh, boarding school, and I was forced to attend formal government education. And I was probably the first generation of people from this region to attend formal uh, education. And, uh, you know, lucky enough when I was in high school, you know, I got the opportunity to attend, um, to visit the great Masai Mara. And I witnessed, you know, conservation in action. I saw the wildebeest migration. I saw the diversity of life that was there. I saw, you know, the grasslands, I saw the habitats, I saw the rangers. And from that moment, I was actually uh, decided that I wanted to, to be a ranger serving animals. And of course, um, given that there was one critically endangered species next door, I started focusing on the conservation of, of, of this species. Um, so that's how my journey began to practice conservation and particularly focus 
on this species. So it's it's called actually four-eyed antelope just because of that gland, uh, that preorbital gland that's just below the uh, eyes, as you can see. Uh, uh, but um, as it is looking, some people may confuse it with a crossbreed between, you know, an impala and a heartbeast. Uh, but it's a close relative of many other antelopes uh, uh, in Africa, including the wildebeest, the heartbeast, the topi. They're all in the same subfamily. Uh, al Selefinae. Uh, but this Herola is the only extant member of the genus Petrigas. So if we lose Herola today, we are not losing just a species, we are losing an entire genus or evolutionary history uh, of that uh, group. Um, so from, as I mentioned, it's a critically endangered species. Uh, in IUCN classification, there are only two other categories after that, either extinct in the wild or extinct. So it's really uh, in the brink of extinction. And as you can see, it's also uh, closely related to all these other groups, uh, uh, but it's a different lineage. As you can see this, it's, uh, you know, it all is quite distinct from all of us. You know, heartbeast, topi and wildebeest, they all also have, you know, races or subraces or subspecies, but Hirola, we only have one. Uh, um, people often call it as a living fossil or, or living fossil or evolutionary relic. Um, so it's species of global importance. So in terms of uh, conservation status in comparison to other large mammals, for example, uh, a lot of people will mention black rhinos, uh, but they're about 4,000 to 4,500 in the wild, 280 in captivity. Look at their range, it's all the way extensive. Uh, the whole of, you know, uh, so for African wild dogs, it's also another globally endangered species. They're about 3,000 to 5,000 in the wild, they're 300 uh, in captivity, extensive all the way. Adex, which is on no horn of African antelope, they're about 450 in the wild, 300, uh, 3,000 in captivity. So they're really well cushioned from extinction. They're all other less than 500 individual globally, zero in captivity, is only extant member of that genus and has a very small geographical range. So it's really, really on the brink of extinction. Um, so what is the story of the Herola? Um, Herola primarily or entirely subsists on grasses. Uh, in the Horn of Africa and where I come from, uh, people primarily keep just livestock, uh, people are nomadic pastoralists. So there's a lot of competition for grass and most of the area now is barren as we can see. They, they practice also harem defense mating system where there's one male and uh, one uh, with many females and they're seasonal breeders. Uh, often there are peaks in their calving season uh, with well synchronized with the rainy season. Of course, rainfall has become highly variable and this has brought also a lot of problems uh, in the survival of the calves as we're going to see. And uh, they also form patchalah hearts like many other uh, antelopes and uh, they dispersed at nine months. So in, it was first described in 1888 uh, by a British zoologist and then the first government intuition was to translocate them from their natural range to somewhere outside their range, actually in Savo East National Park. Uh, but that population did not do well. Uh, and in 1973, the, uh, 73, the first protected area was established in this area called Arawala National Reserve. Uh, but a few years later, uh, because of the remoteness of this location, uh, Arawale collapsed the first the world lost the only formal protected area for this species. And then there were a few animals that were taken into zoos, but a few years later also, all that population became non-viable with only two individuals remaining. They were affected by bacterial infection and uh, stress. So they all as well died. In 1985, uh, there was a massive drop of the population due to the disease called rinderpest which is a bovine viral disease that is common uh, in this area. Uh, but that was also eradicated at some point, but that did not trigger the recovery of this species. And we're going to see why. 
in 2011, we did uh, a, a census, a national census survey across the entire geographical area of these species. And we estimated about 400 to 500 individuals still surviving uh, in their natural range. So, uh, after that, we formed the Herola Conservation Program in which we uh, started uh, sort of a multi-dimensional approach to their conservation with community education, habitat restoration, tree site, all that brought together to see if we can rescue uh, this uh, species. So as you may agree with me that they are the brink of extinction, they're facing a lot of threats. They are outside formal government protected areas. Uh, they are in communal lands. Uh, so their fit hinges on the tolerance of local communities. Uh, also local ambassadors like myself uh, to secure their future. Uh, uh, so we needed to grow some sort of homegrown solution. And that's how my journey uh, started. Uh, so to explain a little bit about what is causing the decline, and also why they are not able to bounce back, uh, we will need to do, to do a little bit of uh, science. And uh, for those of you who don't like graphs, you will forgive me. Uh, but this shows uh, the decline of Rola coincided with that of elephants. As you can see, uh, certainly there's a relationship. Uh, so because of the proximity, for those of you who know geography very well, the location of Northeastern Kenya or Somalia is very close to the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, you know, Yemen is next door. You know, India, China is also next door. Uh, uh, so because of that, you know, um, that Arabian market, uh, all the elephants in this region were poached. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s. And what elephant does for Hirola is that elephants used to maintain habitat. They open grasslands, they break down trees, uh, and they uh, sort of maintained the landscape uh, or maintained the natural range of what Hirola requires. So given that the elephant have gone, there's uh, some sort of a landscape change in the region and we're going to see how that has happened. And this is the render paste I mentioned, as you can see, but that did not trigger the recovery. Of course, the landscape has changed. So in general, um, you know, habitat loss is a big driver of global species decline. And of course, that is more pronounced along the equator where we have, you know, more species uh, and, and nearly 40% of IUCN listed species, you know, habitat is the primary driver. So a critical area to start with is the habitat of Hirola OK. And that was the first question we asked. Uh, so we, this is sort of the native range, uh, the native range. And of course they, okay, they also occurred in some part of Somalia, historically, Southwestern Somalia, but they became extinct. Uh, they're now extinct and they're only now on this small location in, in Kenya. So we looked at this polygon uh, to see what has happened. And for us to understand that, we looked at a satellite imagery, uh, landsite imagery of the range of the Hirola. Of course, it's a small range, so it fits perfectly into one Landsat scene, uh, satellite scene. Uh, and this is you know, how the situation was in 1985. So what you are seeing, the linear future you're seeing right here is Tan River. Kenya's longest river and marks the western boundary of the Herola's geographic rim. Herola just occurs to the east of this river. The brown areas represent grass, the green areas represent trees. And what did you say about Herola food requirement? They primarily require grass. So given that elephants are gone, livestock have increased by 400 times. Uh, in this region, uh, there's a massive landscape change that happens uh, here. And by 2012, all these areas have changed into woodlands, leaving Herola with nowhere to call home and with no food on the table. Subsequently, this species has experienced near total range collapse. Nowhere to go. 
as the forest encroached into the habitat. And of course, because of droughts and other factors, this whole area has become unbearable for, for this species. Of course, drought, uh, which is common in the Horn of Africa and what we experience now, favors the growth of trees over grasses. Elephants, once you lose mega herbivores also in the system, there's uh, consequences, okay? So we asking if, you know, Hirola is experiencing what we call extinction debt, given that elephants are gone and now they are trailing the loss of elephants and must continue to decline. So now Hirola is considered as a refugee species like many other species. And refugee species are species persisting or in suboptimal areas within their habitat, either the fringe of the historical geographic range or something happening within the system or they're outside the range or they are persisting somewhere where it's not considered optimal. And the consequence of that is that everything becomes an uh, issue, survival becomes an issue, pregnancy rates, fecundity, survival, recruitment, everything becomes a problem. Of course, uh, uh, if you are in suboptimal habitat, fitness becomes an issue, okay? Fitness of the species, the ability to recruit yourself becomes an issue. And if that becomes an issue, the area where you are becomes sink rather than source for the species. So, and Hirola are very sensitive to disturbance when they have the right food, when they have the right, when they're in the right location or the right habitat, uh, you know, they have all these muscles, um, you know, very clean skin, uh, body conditions look perfect. Um, and that's where they're seeing, you know, a very green landscape with short grasses and open habitat, okay? But when, you know, droughts happen or other perturbations within their landscape, uh, you know, they become this emaciated, very sad to look at them, uh, and they become really depressed, very stressed, very stressed, and they die in masses, they die. So given this, uh, of course, there's a landscape change that we have seen, uh, but the key question will be, well, what will be the relative role of predation, fastest degradation, uh, fastest degradation in driving their declines? A lot of people have argued that it's predators driving their decline, okay? But it's hard also to imagine a situation in which native predators will drive a native prey to extinction without additional participation. Or if each of them is contributing what will be the relative role, given that in conservation, we need to have some sort of an evidence approach to conservation actions. Of course, with the limited funds of conservation, you can't you know, do random implementations of ideas. Oh, you know, I want to try this, I want to try this, I want to try this. Of course, you, you might succeed, but you may also end up losing a lot of time and resources, given that uh, you did not pinpoint the key issues driving their decline. So we also focused on looking the role of, 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 of predation, first and second degradation. And of course, uh, when ecologists think of uh, range degradation uh, or demography, they look at the relative role of uh, you know, predation and range quality. But added complexity to this is that uh, they they are expected to differentially impact population growth. Of course, uh, the size of that will indicate the potential impact. And um, these are different age classes, of course. Uh, you know, calf predation, for example, will heavily impact calf survival, may impact subadult survival, may, you know, limitedly impact adult survival. Okay. We don't know how it may impact fecundity or pregnancy rates, okay? 
rent quality similarly heavily may impact on calf survival, subadult survival, or adult survival. Okay. In addition, uh, you know, lambda could be differentially sensitive to variation in the survival of different age classes. Okay. So we needed to look at all this to have a clear idea of, you know, where we can put in some extra energy to bolster the population. Um, so for us to do this, we had large scale exclosure experiment in which we moved in individuals from outside the range and closed in in a fence, we call it predator proof sanctuary. And then we also set up a community conservancy in which we removed or minimized livestock grazing. Uh, and we compared, you know, survival or, or we compared vital rates across these settings, these three different settings. And we moved these individuals, so as you can see, you know, we helicopter, we used helicopters, uh, you know, and moved these individuals into, in, into the predator proof sanctuary. And as you can see, you know, Lambda was highest in where we had the fence. And the way you interpret Lambda or population growth rate is that if it is above one, it means positive population growth. If it is below one, it is a negative population growth or it's a sink. That population is not growing. So the only place where we realized positive population growth was inside the fence where we removed predators and we also removed livestock. Okay. Um, so in summary, we had a declining trend from the sanctuary to the conservancy to the uh, open rangelands, which is representative of the uh, native uh, Pirola range. Predation depresses lambda primarily through survival of all age classes plus reduced fecundity. Low range quality depresses lambda primarily through adult survival. Uh, of course, I was not able to share the whole story, uh, but I'm giving you some of the key findings. Uh, yes, we also found that predation and low range quality have comparable impact on lambda, suggesting that increase in range quality is key to future introduction. Uh, given that carnivore control is logistically difficult and probably unethical. Um, so the way to address that chronic null number is by restoring the habitat. And that's what we focused on. And of course, uh, as I said, that we need, you know, evidence-based approach uh, to restoring habitat. And that's why we had uh, to reducing species or increasing the numbers. And that's why we had to go through all that. Um, so the next necessary step will have been to look at how do we restore habitat to what it was, um, you know, four, four decades ago. And of course, a lot has been said about uh, governing the commons, uh, the tragedy of the commons that everybody knows. Um, of course, this species occurs in completely, you know, outside formal government protected areas. We had a variety of suggestions, you know, elephant introduction, we can do it. We can, you know, reduce the number of lives that people are owning, okay? Uh, if people are willing, uh, we can receive the area. But given that these are communal areas and hinges the support of the local communities, we needed to ask as an important step if they are willing to support some of these interventions. So we talked to the local communities and asked them some of these questions and I'll share a few of them. Is for example, do you support reducing the number of livestock you own to improve range quality? And uh, what you have on your X axis is agree, disagree, and neutral. And you see like this was an important proposal from us, but they completely refused and said, we don't want to reduce the number of livestock we own. And we know that overgrazing is a key issue for Hirola. But this is what the locals are saying, that we don't want to reduce our livestock. We, okay, do you support seeding and fertilizing the land to improve range quality? And they're saying, yes, we agree, okay? We ask them, do you entertain a possibility 
of elephant reintroduction in your historical area. Surprisingly, they say yes, because elephants provide a lot of ecosystem services. Uh, uh, a lot of them could relate to livestock productivity. And given that they've all witnessed change degradation over the years, they were willing to take this risk and for us to bring back elephants. Uh, so this is how the current habitat look like uh, with invasive acacia efficiency on the landscape. All this, you know, you will find all these trees that look almost the same height that you think they were planted the same day, but there's nothing underneath. There's no understory vegetation, okay? The range has been degraded completely and all these trees. So there's a lot of massive bush encroachment, a lot of woody biomass that we don't know what to do with, okay? And are threatening the survival of a globally endangered species. So given that we, we can't introduce elephants, in part of the world that is volatile. Of course, the Kenya Somali border is a very unstable region uh, with a lot of small arms in the hands of people. It is almost impossible to bring back elephants that require 24 hour security, even elsewhere in Kenya, even within, you know, tightly monitored protected areas, elephant support. So in such a situation, it was almost impossible for us to suggest that we will bring back elephants. Of course, we wanted to encourage natural recolonization of elephants into the region, but having that discussion of bringing back elephants, uh, you know, we just put it under the table. You know. So we asked the community to act as the elephant and thin down the trees. Uh, so we worked with local communities, uh, you know, to cut down, to minimize, uh, to thin down trees and open habitat for Hirola as, a, as an important step. We also looked at the soil to see um, seed bank, the soil seed bank, uh, you, know, you know, why are we not seeing you know, grass? Is it because of compaction? Is it because of lack of seed in the soil? Or is it because of moisture availability that is limiting the growth of grasses? Uh, so given that we do not have any information, we started also looking at different soil types and, and see uh, how uh, all the factors that are limiting the growth of grasses. And uh, of course, I mentioned some of the restor restoration success likely varies across soil types and targeted species and approach to use. So all these could be possibilities, you know, manual removal of trees, you can have, you know, plant grazing of livestock, you can have voluntary livestock reduction. You can disturb the soil, uh, soil ripping, which is just manually breaking the soil, but not removing the soil. Uh, seeding and fertilizing, uh, control bands, elephant conservation and reintroduction. All these are possibilities. Of course, Kenya has, you know, surplus elephants elsewhere. Uh, there are areas where elephant uh, population is growing. And of course, if the region was stable, we could get some of those elephants. But given our situation, uh, you know, that's not a possibility. So we focused on few of these techniques, uh, including soil ripping, manual removal of trees, and seeding and fertilizing. Of course, we can do control bands because we don't have understory vegetation to carry the fire. Uh, so we, across three soil types, we first tested the responses of, you know, four native grasses to different restoration, uh, tilling, um, tilling, seeding, and of course not, you know, this was an experiment. I don't want to focus on it, but uh, we looked at the performance of four key Hirola grasses to see how they will perform if we restore them. Um, so this is grass height across different soil types. Of course, Hirola prefers uh, uh, chloris uh, and sengrass, which is also the same grasses that livestock depend on. And of course, Entropogon and Eragrostis, uh, also key other uh, grasses that depend on. And of course, um, the response wasn't that bad. Uh, unfortunately, this coincided uh, with the droughts and uh, all the other things going on in the Horn of Africa. 
uh, and of course we have interruptions, but I said the few times we had moisture or rainfall, uh, um, you know, you will see the landscape quickly changing and across different soil types. And this is grass cover uh, across, uh, across soil types. Uh, and we can, we have changed some of the landscape to look like this from, you know, the previous slide that I show you, that was showing just the acacia uh, trees. And, uh, and so we are monitoring uh, some of these areas. And the idea is to, given that we have moisture issues uh, in this region, is to sort of establish uh, grass islands across strategic areas, specific areas where we selected with favorable biotic and abiotic conditions that we think will allow the grass to establish, persist and eventually spread through natural processes like pollination. And uh, of course, eventually compete with you know, the trees. Of course, this was a savanna area and savanna by definition is just a codominance between trees and grasses, right? So we want to try to see if you can ensure there's a balance in the landscape. And the responses of Hirola, uh, of course, was very surprising. And they spent, you know, all their time in areas where we restore, um, you know, when they can't wait, we clear the seas. Once we open a the space, they move in, okay? Uh, so they're desperately looking for food and we are working hard to ensure that we're able to match their requirement and scale this to a landscape level uh, where they're able to meet all their requirements within their native range. Uh, um, and of course, there are issues of how do we control you know, communities once they see we have extra grass in the landscape, how do you tell them not to increase their livestock? And we have seen situations, okay? We also having a situations in which we establish a grass island, uh, people move in their livestock and want to keep their livestock in the island that we restored before even the grasses have established themselves. We have had that situation as well, okay? Uh, so we started some sort of an intensive education program in which the communities are able to understand the process that we're doing and also understand our ultimate goal of trying to improve the range. And also we share with them the plight of the Herola. Of course, they are now seeing that there are no elephants in the region. And we're telling them Herola is next, you will not see them. There are only 500 of them left, okay? And they're very rare. So unless we restore the habitat for this interrupt, these species will disappear. And they are nodding, of course, the future of Hirola is not, you know, elsewhere. It's not, uh, you know, in South Africa or Southeast National Park. It's in their native range. So if we don't fix what is happening in where they know best, then we can never win this war. And now we are able to harvest native seeds of grass seeds from our own islands, and we are not buying from elsewhere in Kenya where we started. So we, when we are starting this program, we were buying some of these grass seeds from you know, a, somewhere in Baringo, which is, you know, elsewhere in Kenya, another part of, another province in Kenya. Now we're able to produce our own seeds and we're proud of that. Uh, and we're also trying to see if we can scale it to some sort of a nature-based enterprise in which local women groups can harvest the grass and then we can buy from them and use that to still precede uh, the larger landscape and then scale this up into uh, you know, different community conservation areas uh, so that we eventually meet the needs of Ferola across their, their range. And these are some of the people who are helping us to thin down the invasive trees. In fact, this tree in which they're shedding under is one of those problematic trees. It's called Acacia Reficience and uh, it's been, been a problem across many East African rangelands. Uh, I don't know if it's also the same uh, issues affecting cheetahs in Namibia, probably it is. Uh, and, and these are some of the communities we are working with. Uh, so these are some of the scouts that's also monitoring the islands and doing uh, the monitoring. 
So we train them, some of them as restoration technicians, and they're able to record some of the basics uh, data we require to be collected either quarterly or monthly or soil sampling. They have all the skills uh, uh, or even monitor um, you know, precipitation, uh, for example, using rain gauges uh, that are locally made. Uh, and now we are celebrating, uh, you know, some of these successes together with the local communities. Uh, you know, we established Wild Hero League for the first time in 2015, it wasn't there. And now we are celebrating with Kenya Wildlife Service and it's a national day. We, we are trying to make it globally and seeing if we can uh, put in the calendars of many other institutions uh, to celebrate with us. Uh, but uh, it's a day we established to you, you know, reflect on some of the efforts we are doing. So the, and, and, and this is uh, uh, one of the Arawala National Reserve that I mentioned in the beginning that we are also restoring uh, for the first time. It's going to be back on its feet and it's going to uh, become uh, uh, the first formerly government protected area to support the conservation of flora. Of course, there are community conservancies surrounding it, so it will provide an important pillar uh, to the growth of those conservancies surrounding uh, surrounding the, the, the reserve. Um, and our goal generally is to, once we restore these lands and create these islands, uh, is to increase those vital rates that I mentioned, you know, survival, pregnancy, uh, recruitment, all those things are important. Of course, if we improve adult survival alone, the population is likely to grow, okay? So uh, if we increase food, for example, just food alone, we are likely to impact population growth, okay? Uh, is the primary issue uh, affecting Herola. Uh, of course, there's no evidence that predators have been increased in this region. None at all, uh, of course. Um, and of course, there are many other, you know, similar prey uh, of the same size, like topi, uh, you know, grenoops, um, oka in the same region. Um, um, so predators uh, have sufficient food, okay? Um, there could be an issue of apparent competition in which uh, Herola, um, I mean, these aggregations, other aggregations of antelopes attract the, spirit, the predators and eventually they kill Herola. Uh, that could be a possibility. We don't have evidence yet. Uh, uh, but our goal is to increase all these small vital rates and ensure that we are able to bolster the growth of the population over time and uh, see the changes and, mo and, and, and monitor. Of course, we, uh, we have an adaptive management approach in which we are able to adjust the situation. But uh, as you can see, this is a newborn calf, of course, and the future is here where they are. Of course, of course you can see how harsh it is, how barren it is uh, with no grass, Okay, of course, if there's no grass, there's no sufficient milk from the mother. And if there's no sufficient milk from the mother, it means that growth or survival will be at all order. And this is the situation we want to change. We want them to have a future that is secure in terms of both space, habitat, and food. And for an endangered species to recover, of course, it requires a lot of steps. It requires like a long-term commitment, okay? Uh, decades of work combined together, okay, sustained. It requires conservation actions that meet the scale and the threat of the species, okay? It requires evidence-based approach and adaptive framework with clear theory of change. It requires dedicated local leadership that drives the vision and it requires continuous sustained funding. So we summarized all that into this national recovery and action plan for this species in which 
is sort of a multi-stakeholder uh, inputs that was brought together and the various players that are addressing different areas. Uh, but in, in overall, this is the picture, this is the roadmap, roadmap we have to secure the future uh, of this species. And of course, it's the same blueprint for any other, any other species. Um, uh, one of the key issues with Herola before was that it depended a lot on uh, um, parachute science, parachute conservation, of course, uh, with foreigners and uh, you know foreign experts, you know, leading the exit to conservation of the species, with nobody wanting to work in this remote location where it is, uh, and that has led us to where we are now with almost you know, species disappearing uh, in the hand, given that locals have not been engaged to the extent necessary. And of course, uh, uh, given that uh, you know, um, now we have local ambassadors like me who are leading the way, uh, we are changing. It may be a bit too late, uh, but we are very optimistic. We are cautiously optimistic that uh, we can reverse the situation given that uh, we have the support of the local communities now, we have you know, the science necessary to uh, guide the conservation actions. We have the necessary international network necessary for the conservation of these species uh, and the necessary funding coming from uh, you know, different partners and also uh, uh, local governments. Uh, so with all that, we have no reason to fail, and uh, uh, we want to see a future for the species. And of course, uh, I'm getting this quote from Eleanor Ostrom, uh, and she says, there's no reason to believe that bureaucrats, politicians, no matter how well-meaning are good at solving problems than the people on the spot who have the in strongest, who have the strongest incentive to get the solution right. There's nobody more motivated than myself and the local communities here to see the recovery of Rola. So we must get the solutions right. And we are working hard day and night to ensure that we secure their future, and we are doing that, uh, you know, through you know research, conservation, education, and also capacity building of the local communities. With that, I'd like to say thank you to all the partners who have supported uh, our work uh, in the past and also uh, now. And uh, with that, I will uh, take questions and say thank you for. Your attention. So I am opening up the uh, screen, as it were, to uh, live questions and answers. I will get to the chat section. Um, uh, but first, I want to give a chance to those who would like to ask a question in person. So please use um, the reaction tools that Zoom so kindly provided us with or just uh, stand up and wave at me and I will, um, I'll get to you. If not, uh, just wanna see if there's anyone. If not, Dr. Ali, I'm going to start in the chat section then with uh, Peter Mills' question. Um, he's asking uh, Dr. Ali, what ex situ strategies are there in place to secure at least a population that might in future supplement natural population? Having said that, what is the future prognosis of the antelope's natural habitat? You have answered that in your uh, in your talk somewhat, um, but how are your hopes um, with regards to this? So I'm just going to ask you to unmute, but I do believe you can unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, given that the government forcefully translocated individuals. Uh, from the native range, the local communities have become paralyzed 
paralyzed uh, in the sense that the, there was a legal tussle between the local communities and the government uh, not to take individuals from their native range, save them within their native range or establish a protected leader within their native range. Uh, but the view by then of conservationists who were advising the government was that we require to take these individuals elsewhere where it's more safer, uh, with more stable environment. And of course, uh, as an insurance against anything, climate disease or anything. Um, but that wasn't very communicated very well. And it led to a lot of conflict between the communities and, and, and the government to a situation in which now you can take any animal, even with government force of power. So uh, there are still few individuals in Savoy National Park. Uh, I think um, nearly 60, 60 individuals are still surviving in Savoy National Park. Uh, and uh, there's a possibility of uh, doing a fence in that area as well to grow the population. Uh, uh, but that population, since they were taken, I think, in the 1960s, and then they were, it was argumented also in 1990s, it, never was, it was never growing. So they don't know the reason why it was never growing. Is it predators or just in the wrong habitat? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, still very unclear. So even if we do the fence and grow the population, uh, uh, still uh, we are not sure about the, how this population will, will behave. About the habitat, the natural habitat, of course, we have seen the restoration is working. Uh, it, can, it can work, but we have, you know, extreme climate variability. Uh, we are in a very arid area. I think average rainfall is less than 300 millimeter annually uh, in that region. Um, so given that, and because of the current climate uh, drought situation, uh, we are losing even the areas where we are storing to drought because this, in this particular uh, time, we haven't received rain for, for four consecutive seasons, which is very awkward situation. So unless we you know, start practicing things like uh, um, cloud seeding or I don't know what else we can do, um, or unless the situation changes, we are facing also some difficulties uh, in terms of climate. And I'm not very sure how we can address that variability uh, at a local scale in particular. Uh, but if we receive the situation changes and the, we receive sufficient rain, I'm optimistic that uh, we can turn around things and we can provide the necessary food uh, for these species and uh, open spaces for, for them and they can once again flourish in this area. Lovely, thank you very much, Dr. Ali uh, Peter. I hope that answered your question. Uh, let's go to Dr. Taylor, I'm asking you to unmute. Thank you, Peter. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, given the small population and the effectively small um, range, um, how much how much information is there on the on the genetic variation on the gene pool with, within that antelope? Uh, you know, in particular, you know, if one's going to look at taking a small cohort out of the population for um, you know to try and protect them, uh, you know, that might that might mean one needs to know you know to what extent the the genetic variation is in terms of heterozygosity and things like that. So how much information is there, is there available on the on the the um, the gene pool? Yeah, there's uh, there's a limited information, uh, but one recent study pointed out that uh, there's no bottleneck at all. Uh, the population is, is small, but it's also widespread. Uh, uh, so okay. there's uh, this you know good connectivity between the individuals that are remaining. Uh, of course, it may become 
concern in the near future. Uh, but for now, uh, uh, there's a recent study um, that showed that uh, that is not a problem uh, at this particular point. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. Um, and that definitely answered, um, just give me a moment, Patrick's question as well. It's exactly the same question, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, anyone else that would like to ask a question? Uh, there's nothing more in the chat section. Maybe Dr. Ali, I'm, I'm, I'm going to add to Dr. Taylor's question and to Patrick's question. Um, if the population, as you've stated, is, uh, is, is quite varied um, and individuals are not the same, you don't have a bottleneck at the moment, um, is there, and I might have missed it, and if you said so, I am sorry that I missed it in the talk, is there a breeding program to ensure that the uh, genetic diversity stays um, as it is or uh, doesn't go into a bottleneck at this given moment? Um. So the only program we have was that uh, the predator proof sanctuary uh, mm -hmm. in which, you know, individuals were taken from uh, the areas adjacent uh, mm -hmm. and they were moved into the fence area. Um, of course, the population grew from about 48 individuals to, uh, I think, 130 in eight years ago. Uh, but was opened up uh, and released. Uh, few of them were colored and they all died uh, after a short period. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, the key issue people mentioned was just predators. Uh, uh, so there's the issue of whether they become a predator naive uh, and mm -hmm. was, you know, they stay in the fence. And then once you release and you put all that effort and then eventually you release and you find them, you know, just being killed like that by predators. Uh, I'm not sure how long, how many generations it takes to become predator naive, uh, but there's an argument that it will take, you know, several years to lose that wild instinct. Uh, uh, but uh, the animals that we released, um, you know, I think and mortality was above 60 percent um, um so that is where we are uh, i am um, a lot of uh, people have you know looked at the initial success of you know the population growth uh, oh boom we've increased the numbers mm -hmm. and you know we're seeing it as magic uh, and then here we are you know we open up and you know we're back to square one and we are still scratching our head and, 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 and see what are the next necessary steps. Uh, but it's a discussion that we continue to have. If um, I hear these uh, similar fences that were done for some antelopes in South Africa, um, I don't know whether it was the Sabul or what is the name of the other antelope, if anyone can remind me. Um, if there are lessons we can learn, uh, mm -hmm. Um, I'll be happy uh, to discuss that further, uh, but um, of the, I'm aware that those are some fences that were done for antelopes in, in South Africa, um, but I didn't find sufficient published literature on the successes of introduction or, or post-release information. I don't have that information. Thank you very much, Doctor. And then if there is anyone in the audience that can help um, from maybe South African National Parks or, um, uh, or any one of the major universities in South Africa, please uh, let's uh, contact us and then we'll put you in contact with Dr. Ali. Uh, Professor Van Aas, your hand is up. There we go. Okay. Prof. Ali, thank you for a very informative wach wach. Let me do the, the screen thing. Okay. Thank you for <laughs> a very informative um, presentation. I really appreciate it. I work on animals 
smaller than the, your envelope. But while you were talking, I make a note for BLGY 1663. And specifically when you're referring to the bottleneck effect. And currently in South Africa, we're experiencing a, well, South Africa, Namibia, we're experiencing a bottleneck effect with cheetahs, with the interbreeding that we have with the cheetahs. So if you're referring to the Arola Antinope, um, are we not also going to proceed and move into a bottleneck effect when we start interbreeding with it? If you can ask that, you are breaking a little bit. You can just, just say, okay, say it again. I'm saying I'm currently lecturing to our first year biology students. And one of the examples I'm using with them is the challenge that we have in South slash Southern Africa with the cheetahs with a bottleneck effect because of the interbreeding of the cheetahs. So mm -hmm. my question is, what is going to happen with the um, Hirola antelope if we start interbreeding with them as well? And uh, because you're referring to the bottleneck effect. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it's... It's a, it's a new area that uh, um, we need, uh, you know, scientists to unravel. Um, and uh, we could make predictions, uh, but I, I don't know what will happen. Um, of... If I may have a follow-up question is, um, how will you go about to notify people a little bit more about the effect of antelope versus elephants with the changing of habitats? Um, so we, we just tell them, of course, all these species are connected. Uh, yeah. uh, and the system is one. Uh, you know, with different components. Uh, the antelope is one component, elephants another component. Uh, so we basically share, you know, we start from a broad picture where we share the causes and the consequences of landscape change and then trickle down to the individual contributions or, or consequences for different species. And uh, of course, people here also understand the species diversity. Uh, they practiced mixed herd, uh, uh, herds here. They have camels, they have goats, they have sheep, uh, and some have poultry. Um, of course, they understand uh, the, all the differences. Uh, and of course, the goat requires browse. Uh, the sheep requires grass, uh, you know, the camel requires trees. Uh, they, they, they know how the system works and how different species uh, contribute. And uh, so we just explain to them using simple, you know, sketch maps, um, the contributions of, of, of the species. And uh, in particular, uh, we use the absence of elephants to explain the current uh, plight of Herola, given that uh, they depended on each other. Uh, and now the elephants are gone and we are unable to stop the declining trends of, of, of Herola. Uh, so, and they also know both species very well, more than I do, uh, with a lot of indigenous knowledge, uh, with a lot of also encounters, uh, and also they know when uh, they they can actually explain. I learn from them. Uh, you know, this happened and this happened and this happened, and that's why Hirola is in this situation. Um, and I just try to uh, put a bit of evidence to show what they're explaining to me. Um, so um, 
once we start the conversation, they, they pick it very easily. Um, Lizo, you just need to unmute. <laughs> yes. Um, Prof. Ali, thank you for that answer. So the challenge is back to the community. Please share that indigenous knowledge. Um, and I think that is where we can meet hands and, and move forward. There, there, there's something else developing on LCA slash JS Greens, but if we can hook up after this, please, please share that indigenous knowledge. And thank you for the answer. Thanks, Rido. Thanks, Ali. I'm coming in. Um, just want to mention to everybody, unfortunately, Iran uh, seems to have lost uh, power because of load shedding and uh, tower out on your hand side. So I'm taking over the questions and answers. Over to Luan Taylor, Dr. Llewellyn Taylor, please. Uh, over to you, Lou. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, Liesl, as far as I'm aware, uh, cheetahs uh, basically start off with a low, a low, um, well, a high homozygosity base and a low genetic variation anyway. So when it comes to to any breeding pro program, you're going to have a problem with them. Uh, however, you know, with the Hirola, that, that's why I asked the question really is, you know, what sort of genetic variation levels we have there? Because I'm not quite sure what kind of specialist it is. And I mean, cheetahs are highly, highly specialized animals, and that's maybe the reason why they have such low genetic variation. So, so yeah, I, I agree. The bottleneck effect is clearly a possibility. Um, uh, Dr. Ali, I don't know how you would want to react further to that. Yeah, I think, as you said, it is. Uh, uh, so, so the the low numbers that we have for Herola are a bit present. Uh, given that uh, in the 1960s, there were about 16,000 of them uh, in the same spot. Uh, okay. So there's a bit of diversity already uh, accumulated okay. in there. Um, so okay. in the future, it may become a problem. Uh, but as I mentioned, it is we do not find any evidence at this particular point. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Llewellyn. Um, uh, the, the question in the chat, um, have you ever thought of sourcing for funds to draw boreholes to mitigate during the dark periods? From Patrick uh, Lumumba. Uh, please, Dr. Ali. What it is uh, asked? Sourcing for funds from? Uh, it, the question is, have you ever thought of sourcing for funds to draw boreholes to mitigate during the dark periods? Yes. Uh... So there's a lot of, uh, in this region, there's a lot of uh, humanitarian work because of the refugees from Somalia. We're also hosting the largest refugee camp uh, just north of the Hirolos Ranch. So there's a lot of humanitarian organizations that have been assisting humans uh, yeah. and doing boreholes, uh, of course, providing a lot of fixed infrastructure uh, in the area. Of course, it's one of the key issues of habitat fragmentation here. Uh, uh, but during the recent drought, uh, Herola was not one of the species that was heavily impacted by the drought, but uh, giraffes were mostly heavily uh, impacted. Uh, this is the first time we found, you know, giraffes dying out of dehydration, um, giraffes starving, uh, browsing on dead uh, trees and branches. So a key issue was uh, you know, what kind of help should we ask for? Uh, how do we feed wild giraffes and how do, what, what do we feed them? And, uh, you know, I was getting suggestions from all over that, you know, feed them with cubes, uh, horse cubes, or, you know, livestock um, feeds. Um, but how do we give them also was another issue. These are just wild uh, animals. And of course, uh, by the time they were collapsing, they were requiring like sort of an emergency uh, medical care rather than actually food. Uh, by the time we were able to get our hands on and uh, it was you know, quite challenging. And I think it's an area that we should focus on in the near future to figure out um, you know, a way to mitigate giraffes. Uh, I mean, to mitigate drought uh, on impact of drought on wildlife uh, as 
most of the available literature just point out to you know humanitarian responses and uh, i think it's it's an area where we can have you know students look at and uh, see if we can draw a clear mitigation strategies for for ILF. but it was very difficult uh, for us to figure out we tried a couple of things um, i think the only thing that worked in future was providing acacia feeds mm -hmm. acacia ports to giraffes mm -hmm. which they loved but i bought a lot of things from the cities and all that but it did not work um, um, of course, providing water uh, was easy, mm. as you could just do a water pan and put the water mm. uh, and you know leave it overnight and animals will come mm. and, and drink. But food was an issue, key issue. Uh, for Hirola, and is, is a very shy species, mm -hmm. very skittish in nature. Uh, they don't like humans or disturbances at all mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we tried to provide supplemental feeding uh, but they didn't take it uh, mm. and uh, i don't know if we had the necessary habituation time mm. uh, uh, but we tried a couple of times uh, with both in, you know dead grass with live green mm. grass uh, um, and uh, they will just move next to it and they will not look at it. Mm. And um, I'm still figuring out how I can get their attention uh, when I have uh, food that uh, is from uh, not their own habitat, but mm. from elsewhere. Yeah. And, I, see, uh, I see that uh, Roland Goods, uh, hi Roland, good to see you again. Uh, that he's got his hand up, Roland. I uh, just want you to unmute and then add on to or share wisdom or... Okay, thanks, Chris. I found this very interesting. Thank you. Um, just to, a, a word of caution about uh, the water, well, the, the provision of, of water, artificial water. Uh, speaking from my experience in the Natal Parks Board, uh, where water su was supplied for hard for tourism, and uh, the population of a, uh, an animal that was adapted to living under dry condition, the Sunni, uh, nearly became extinct because what it did was it created conditions for uh, animals that, uh, because obviously the Rhone is not a water dependent species, other animals, many of them like the giraffe are. So what you do is you create another problem by bringing in animals that wouldn't normally be there now in competition with the animal you're trying to protect. That's just an experience. Mm. Yeah, there's quite a debate on about artificial war, boreholes and water holes and things becoming a bigger and bigger issue uh, because of the dependency and and uh, so uh, it's something that you have to re really think through very well. Uh, Dr. Ali, you still wanted to add anything there? Uh, yes, um, just to say that uh, this was really an emergency situation. Uh, of course, it was not a. Uh, we we these were not for animals within a national park, but within a communal areas. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, at some point when we got the rain, we stopped. Uh, so we we did not continue sustained it, uh, but. Uh, it was the design of it, of how to do it, especially in community uh, areas uh, mm -hmm. where there's, you know, free ranging livestock are also desperate. Um, humans are also uh, suffering. Uh, was a big headache um, on, you know, what to prioritize and what to leave. Um, so we, of course, there were a lot of people who were focusing on humans, but the little, effort you put into uh, wildlife is also seen as, you know, ignoring humans and uh, people view it uh, negatively in uh, particularly in communal areas. And of course, we do not have the capacity to have, you know, big scale of showing our efforts everywhere. Uh, so that uh, was also something that we 
hard to swallow uh, and entertain. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, I think in in the future, uh, we of course the communities have some boreholes that are working. Uh, given that I mentioned that the humanitarian organizations that have established boreholes in these areas, but uh, one key area, one key issue that emerged from that experience was that uh, if we could provide extra fuel to communities to leave the taps running at night when humans are least active, uh, provided some extra space for wildlife to drink uh, water. So we. Mm -hmm end up collaborating with communities or water users to provide uh, extra subsidized fuel. And then they leave the taps running uh, or the troughs with water. And then wildlife will come in at night uh, and, and, and take that water. Mm -hmm. So that worked really well in our area. Thank you. I want to check if there are any more questions. I think we've covered the questions in the chat. Dr. Ali, when I look at the chat and I see the appreciation coming through um, for what you do, and then of course, um, as person, we just want to encourage you and thank you and say, just keep on going. Uh, it's all passion that drives, I think, most of us. And uh, your passion is what will also take uh, things forward together with the teams and everybody involved. So from our side, we want to thank you. We really appreciate your time and trouble.